Hello, party people. It's time for an office hour speed round. It's been a little while since we've done one of these where I'm going to rip through a bunch of office hours questions in the queue that don't really require very long answers. So first off, we have disgruntled app developer asks, Hi Brent, a friend was recently reprimanded from using a trace in production. Good. Stop doing that. The rationale was performance impact, correct, and other potential issues that weren't forthcoming. Any thoughts on why traces have an impact in production? Yes, Microsoft SQL Server will slow down production so that your trace can keep up. If you have to use a trace, you should look into server-side traces, which will at least minimize the impact. But honestly, Trace has been uh, kind of deprecated for uh, maybe like a decade now. Uh, and the thing that you want to move to is either using the plan cache for analysis or extended events. Next up, we have Krishna asks, what are the top issues that you see with SQL file stream? When you store files in the database, your transaction log backups, always on availability groups, database mirroring, etc., adds a huge amount of overhead in pushing those changes to other places. So if you put, say, a one gigabyte file, just to give you simple numbers, one gigabyte file in a transaction log, that's that's got to be laid out into transaction log backups and then pushed out to your availability group secondaries. When you have files, there's a much better recent development that you should use called a file system. What's that? I'm being told that file systems aren't new. That's probably true as well. Dwight asks, any recommendations for where to place master database? Don't put it on the operating system disk. Never put any databases on the operating system disk because sooner or later somebody's going to put stuff in there and it's going to grow and fill up and you run the danger of the operating system not starting elegantly when it runs out of drive space. So start there. Next up, Statistics Rule says, Hola, Compañero, when running SQL Server on SSDs, can I completely disregard fragmentation? Google for Brent Ozar fragmentation, and there are tons of videos with me explaining the same concept like five different ways. Uh, next up, we have Isaac. Isaac asks, have you had experience with SQL installations on Nutanix? Yes. Especially high-end systems, in your opinion, is there an upper limit for SQL in a virtual environment? So set aside virtualization right now. For me, Nutanix has been a hot mess with SQL Server because they try to synchronize writes across several places serially, one at a time. So if SQL Server has 10 transactions and they're done one at a time, like someone says, begin tran, do this, commit, begin tran, commit, the Nutanix tries to sync each individual write across several different uh, uh, little pizza boxes. And it's just a recipe for slow transactional performance, anything that's going to involve singleton transaction log writes. Uh, folks over at Nutanix will surely say, well, no one would ever insert one record at a time. Unfortunately, the cold reality of OLTP is that's often how those kinds of boxes work. Uh, Lucas asks, hi, Brent, what are your thoughts on Microsoft Defender for SQL? I didn't know they had it until like two, three weeks ago, I think. So I have no thoughts on it whatsoever, and I haven't looked at it at all either. All Alone asks, Hi Brent, are DBA still using log shipping delays to protect against oops deletes? I, I think most database administrators don't even think to plan for oops deletes, so I don't, know, I don't think that I would say that a lot of them are using it. Are there any developer-specific tools that prevent oops deletes? Yes, it's called soft deletes. Instead of actually deleting the row in the database, what you add is a column called is deleted, yes or no. And you start with that, of course, populated to no. Whenever you do a delete, you populate that to yes instead. That way, then, the uh, rows are still inside the database. You just need to modify your application to make sure that it only shows rows where is deleted equals no. Then you can do things like a recycle bin inside, inside your own application code to let users undo those deletes without having to escalate things to a database administrator. James says, is there any commercial training available for SP Human events? It's not mine, it's Eric Darling's. So check over at ericdarlingdata.com to see what his re uh, most recent training offerings are. I don't actually know if he's got uh, training for human events or not. He has a ton of YouTube stuff about it. I just don't know if he's got uh, commercial training on it. 
Uh, next up, uh, Frito Bandito says, Hi, Brent, which I love it. My, 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 my. Says, do you know a good way to overcome the T-SQL batch size of 65K? It isn't 65K. The statement limit is like 256 megabytes. So I'm not sure where you got that 65K limitation from. Uh, next up, Louis says, is SQL Server in place upgrades acceptable or low risk if the server is virtual and has a snapshot backup for all the databases? For me, no. What I want to do is I want to go build a new SQL Server according to whatever current best practices I'm using because whatever we were doing five, seven years ago back then, we've learned a lot since then. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't learned anything, but I bet you have. I have high faith in you, and I bet there are things about that server you wish you could have done differently. Now's your chance to do those and then get end users to sign off that that server's okay before you restore the databases over to it and migrate. Neil says, I learned a lot from the fundamentals classes. Good. And I'm now c fixing a CPU performance problem in prod. Dev made a table with no indexes, so I added a clustered index. Now I'm thinking I should tell the dev to add a primary key to the ID column instead. It's great that you learned from the fundamentals. Now these kinds of questions indicate that you're ready for mastering index tuning, which I happen to be teaching today. And in mastering uh, index tuning, we teach you when to use a primary key, when to use a clustered index, and how you choose those columns. So definitely check that out next. Next up, Rick says, what are the top NUMA related issues that you run into clients? I almost never run into issues where I go, you know what, to solve this, we should change the physical architecture of the server or change SQL Server settings as to how it deals with that architecture. That is a really edge case problem. And what I usually find when people are focused on those kinds of edge case problems is they miss the really obvious easy stuff like, yo dog, your tables don't have indexes. Or, yo dog, you're running a query a thousand times a second that should really be cached instead. So don't forget to step back and look at what are your server's top weight types before you go off trying to figure out what's the fastest way to clip your toenails because it's just not a real performance problem we most run into. Uh, next up, I use lowercase for select, says, hi, Brent, hope you're feeling better already. Yes, I was down for like three days with a stomach flu. It wasn't COVID, I've tested negative, uh, and I'm now up to five shots. I've had my booster shot uh, in again as well. Uh, so it wasn't COVID, I was very relieved about that, but in terrible stomach flu. Um, I was wondering what the title of the happy tune is you play while letting us do our lab work during your training classes. I use the uh, music app pretzel.rocks, pretzel.rocks, uh, and they have a free plan, but if you use it as a streamer like I do, I'm on a legacy plan that's like $5 a month. I think the current plan is like $10 a month, and I use the up B or Happy EDM, Happy Electronic Dance Music Playlist, with filters set to vo uh, no vocals and no um, adult language, so that it's just, it tends to be just instrumental music and uh, and YouTube friendly too as well. Uh, next up, Ferris asks, Ferris Bueller, <laughs> Ferris B, says, when you were a DBA, did you keep any kind of journal or documentation to show management that you were actually doing work? Yes, I insisted on help desk tickets. Even if it was me doing work for myself, I would create the help desk ticket, assign it to myself, and log my work inside of there. I, I treated myself... Going all the way back to, I'm going to say about probably 2000, no, earlier than that, 1998, 99, when I was working in the hotel business for a hotel company doing IT work, um, I treated myself as an internal consultant. I figured if I built those work habits now, this is not a speed answer, is it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I figured if I built these habits now, I could discipline myself into being ready for it whenever it was time to actually bill for my hours. So I would give my boss a report. Roy, I remember him, Roy Stevenson. I would give my boss a report and say, here's what you spent your salary dollars on this week. You know, here's what I did this week, and here's the effort that I did in order to make our systems stable and reliable so that I could continuously justify my work there. 
Next up, the last Bothon asks, what is the oldest SQL Server version you have parachuted in and worked on? So as a consultant, the work that I do for parachuting in, I'm going to say the oldest I probably worked on was 2005. Um, as a database administrator, 2000 is really where I started considering myself a database administrator. I worked with 7 and I was certified on 7, but I, I, didn't, I wouldn't say that I, I really was that good at it. I, I think I just kind of herped the derp uh, on my way on 7. Uh, next up, Geism asks, any possibility of including other scripts in future versions of the first responder kit? No, those and other scripts that live at other people, uh, other people's GitHub's re GitHub repos, I like that. Those two are both Eric Darling's. Go get those from the original source. For a while there, like we included Ned Otter's SP Blitz in memory OLTP, and then we included, uh, and I was just like, it, it made sense at the time because he was trying to do it like as a Blitz script. Um, but what I've learned over time is I'd r much rather give credit to people in their own GitHub repos and let you go follow those people and, and contribute to their hard work. Uh, next up, Malik says, what are your thoughts about Query Store being enabled by default in SQL Server 2022? It isn't. It's only enabled on new databases created in 2022. So it's not enabled by default on the existing applications that you already have. Um, is this safe? I, you know, I think it's kind of interesting. I think that there are other settings that would be a whole lot safer and more of a payoff. And I'm curious that Microsoft didn't choose those. Cost threshold for parallelism. Read committed snapshot isolation. I think those would be better payoffs. But I don't have a problem with Query Store being on default for newly created uh, databases in 2022. It's been six years since Query Store came out. I think Microsoft learned a lot of really good lessons over the course of those six years, and I think they fixed a lot of the bugs and made the performance improvement uh, pretty low. Also, I think that, that, that we've just learned that people won't put it on. People won't turn it on, and so Microsoft's like, okay, screw you. It's going on. I think Microsoft is probably going to learn some more hard lessons about where people chose not to turn it on on uh, and now weren't aware that it's coming on by default and then have performance blowbacks, but they'll figure that out in support. Good luck with that. Uh, Malik said, no, nothing against Query Store. I, I love the idea of Query Store. It's just, and if you're, oh yeah, we'll stop there. Because <laughs> after all, Malik says, what's your opinion of the new SQL Server Ledger functionality of SQL Server 2022? I think it's one of those checkboxes for marketing that marketing just had to do it. We have blockchain. Uh, but I, I don't think that it's realistically practical because if you want to truly have ledger history to show that a, a complete lineage of a column or a row, that means that you have to keep the complete lineage around for forever. And I think that people are already kind of stunned by how much space transaction logs take. And that if you keep the transaction log around for specific tables forever, I think they're going to be surprised at what they end up with for big data. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Behind the Scenes DBA asks, Hello Brent, any plans to create the, or present the oh, cluster always on training with Edwin this year or in the near future? No, uh, for training for, uh, for Edwin's training classes, go check out Edwin Sarmiento's site and he still offers his training classes through there. If you search for Edwin Sarmiento always on availability group training, you'll probably find it uh, via Google. I just don't remember the URL offhand. Uh, Oslam asks, should new non-clustered indexes be created during business hours or strictly after hours? Any risks? The risk is always that the index doesn't actually make things faster, and in fact it ends up making things slower. Other risks include blocking, long time to create the index over always-on availability groups, database mirroring, replication, log shipping, whatever. Um, so just like any other change to the SQL Server, change equals risk. And you, the, what you have to understand is what are the risks involved with that change? The risks will depend on the size of your application, the frequency of inserts, updates, and deletes, the performance criticality of your queries. And so it's, it's real hard to give a short answer to that question. And of course, this is speed round. That should get you started, though. 
And then finally, we'll take one more. Tug Rule asks, does the SQL Server 5000 row lock escalation mechanism use the estimated number of lock rows? It doesn't use the number of rows. It's about the number of locks. So if you search for Kendra Little, she's a blogger who now works for Microsoft in the documentation team, actually. Kendra Little lock escalation. She has a blog post on how many, uh, how many locks count towards the row escalation limit and what kinds of locks they are. Because there are row level locks, there are also uh, range level locks that you have to take into effect as well. That's why I'm always real, real picky to say around 5,000 rows, because it's not about based on the number of rows. Well, there we go. There's a quick speed round. Hope that y'all learned something and had fun, and I will see y'all in the next Office Hours. Adios.